Spain. I'm uh, professor of economics here at Nichols College. And um, I've been working on a book project uh, called um, uh, Education in the Age of Money. Uh, it's turned into uh, uh, a little bit of a, uh, a two-volume project at this point. Uh, but the, 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 the primary argument is that uh, the, the payoff of, of uh, college uh, is a bit dubious and uh, mainly basis on uh, a report that came out from the census that was claiming that uh, the lifetime uh, increase in income for the average student is $800,000. And I'm able to uh, show by following uh, the average tuition, average loan, average interest rate, and lopping off to which is 5%. So I'm just looking at the 95 percentile, which I dubbed the typical student. Because the typical student doesn't sign a uh, salary of you know, 200,000 plus. So that's, I, I lop that off and say, OK, uh, if you look at just the 95 percentile, what is a typical student making a lifetime of work after going to college, subtracting these things, and it ends up being uh, uh, about $120,000 in a lifetime of work. So this begins to question whether or not the economic motive is, is, is an adequate motive uh, for somebody going to college, because that's an average for the typical student, so some are going to be above it, some are going to be Low it, and so it's a perfectly uh, legitimate claim to uh, to say that uh, it may not pay off and perhaps drop out. And that also uh, only includes those that finish college. If, uh, if you look at the, the ones that go to college, the payoff is even lower. So that's the the, the, the primary uh, thesis. Anyway, so uh, the argument. So I, I go into the labor markets, and the labor markets are getting worse and worse for. Uh, for folks with a college degree, and I, I detail a lot of that uh, data and analysis. Uh, and so that's the primary argument. The, the, the uh, second, there's my good buddy Tom did this too. The, um, the uh, second volume of the book uh, then begs the question, so what is education about? So I unfold that in some detail. You will uh, see me in class with my little schema of you know, uh, job skills being one thing that college does, but also uh, civil uh, engagement and civil participation. You know, uh, informed voting would be an example of that. Personal development, you know, uh, in stages, even in higher education, uh, personal development is still going on. Uh, understanding yourself, understanding your society, uh, there's an aesthetic dimension that's uh, very important to higher education, and then there's a, a existential, or uh, those of us that may be religious, you could even call it a spiritual dimension. And um, I justify those six layers, uh, not only based on what colleges say they do, and you can look at you know, a private a business college like Nichols, baccalaureate speeches or commencement speeches uh, get at this, but even some of the uh, advertising documents, but you know, almost every college you can find some sort of version uh, of promises of, of accomplishing some influx sites along those lines. But the historical evolution of colleges uh, in the United States have emphasized almost, have em emphasized exactly those dimensions, but almost in the, the opposite order. That Harvard was initiated for, you know, spiritual, uh, ethical reasons for the colonies and then get into the aesthetic motive, especially for, for young women and so on and so forth. You know? So, uh, you know, that informs us something about curriculum. And so in the second volume, I unfold some of those details of what we might want to be paying attention to, what we might want our children to be getting from their higher education, and, and then, of course, as uh, professional educators, you know, what we would hope that our students may leave these institutions uh, with the type of knowledge they need. So that's, that's, the, that's the project in, in 
two volumes in the thumbnail sketch. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in full support of that, that uh, Robert. I, I do a counterfactual uh, to sort of get the point across because in the United States, you basically have uh, public education for K through 12. And so uh, almost anybody can find, uh, not free education, but a, a, a tax-based uh, education um, for K through 12. But preschool is very expensive for most families and higher education. So my counterfactual is, okay, if that makes sense to you, if, and, and people will find reasons, I won't rehearse what those reasons are, I say, well, why, why do we end it at 12th grade? You know, just make people then pay for 12th grade or 11th grade or 10th grade. I mean, how far back can you go to until you, until you say, no, that doesn't make sense? Um, and you see elsewhere, that you don't have that sort of Oreo chocolate exception on the outsides. You know, uh, most of Europe uh, daycare is free, and uh, throughout the world there's various places, uh, including Europe, where uh, you have a public option, uh, uh, tax-based uh, higher education. You know, so uh, I think it's feasible for sure. Um, I, I do want to say, Robert. Um, that the, for me, uh, it's not that end of it that I'm most concerned with. I would like uh, just to get uh, the banks out of it, you know, the school loan aspect out of it, um, I think is absolutely crucial. Now to do that probably does mean you need to fix that other side. So there's a lot of interesting things going on right now um, because Obama has gotten private banks out of it. Um, but it only compounds the problem because now the federal government is making massive amounts of money on young people. So it's offensive because people like me should be paying taxes and, and not young people that are in uh, college. Good. You answered my question. All so. Right. I think we're good then. Good. Cool. That was good.